drop. Uh, we are looking forward to your support on the social media. That brings us to our next panel, which is the one specifically on mobility solutions, driving change, startups, innovating mobility solutions. I would like to invite on stage Gilroy Tills, founder and CEO of Ecosperity Mobility. Kartik Chandrasekhar, partner Sangam Ventures. Sangeeta Sharma, General Manager, Sales, South Asia, Lufthansa Group. Rohit Grover, Co-Founder and CEO, Aero, Aerostro Velos Energy. And Mudit Narayan, who will be moderating this one, VP Investments, Bloom Ventures. Folks, while the speakers are arriving on stage, once again, uh, I would like you to keep supporting us on the social media. The hashtag is Stop the Drop. like to thank our gifting partners, once again, Adiva, our startup partner, Ecosperity Mobility, uh, session partners uh, over here, Urja, Urja Energy, Binary Semantics, and Figbytes, and the Lufthansa Group for helping us put this together. Once again, I'd like to invite Gilroy Tills on the stage. Gilroy is the founder and CEO of Ecosperity Mobility. Kartik Chandrasekhar, partner, Sangam Ventures. Sangeeta Sharma, General Manager, Sales South Asia, Lufthansa Group. Rohit Grover, co-founder and CEO, uh, Aristo Willis uh, Energy, Aristo Willis Energy, sorry, sorry about that. Mudit Narayan, uh, VP Investments, Bloom Ventures. Is everybody here? Is Mudit here? Yeah, okay. Good morning, still morning. We have, a, my, yeah. we have a very high powered and a very diverse panel. And uh, I assume that we are the last panel before lunch, right? <laughs> but, but we'll try and cover as much as we can. And uh, you'll see that we come from very different backgrounds or very different perspectives. Let me introduce my speakers for today, my panelists. Um, we have, uh, let, let me start with the, with the lady first. Uh, Ms. Hargita Sharma, she has had a 32 year career at Aftansa. She is a general manager sales for South Asia and has worked across a variety of sectors. We were just talking before the panel and I think her experience goes across the entire company. Um, we have Rohit Grover, a young entrepreneur who is developing a very interesting automotive technology which is an aeroderivative engine for trucks. And has, he's, his company is incubated at IIT Madras and uh, is amongst the, the new breed of entrepreneurs in India who are going into deep tech, and which I am very excited and hopeful about. We have uh, Karthik Janshekhar, my good friend, who runs Sangam Ventures, which was one of the, the people a, a few years ahead of the game in clean tech and climate tech financing and development and has been running an incubator and a fund. And I think understands, breathes, talks about climate change most of the time he's up and about. And finally, now Mr. Gilroy Tellis, the founder and CEO of Ecosperity Mobility. And uh, he's a leader and an entrepreneur, but he's developing a very interesting new technology. People say you can't reinvent the wheel. Well, wait till you hear from him, right? With that, uh, <laughs> let me, let me start, and, and I'm taking the liberty of using a framework, because we're talking of transport mobility, of a four-part framework which many of us think about, and I think it works the best in mobility, which is reducing energy wastage at the first point. I don't think most of us will expect to have, or, or to, to be able to defend the energy consumption of, an, of a large pickup truck or a Rolls Royce if you're going point A to point B. Second is energy conservation when you try and reduce the energy you consume for necessary purposes. Third is reducing energy by design. And uh, how can you design products, processes, technologies, services better to reduce energy consumption and hence uh, mitigate climate change. And finally, design of infrastructure to reduce the need for energy usage. I think we've all uh, seen the impact that the pandemic had on use of video conferences to reduce travel. So in this four-part framework, I'll ask all of my speakers to speak about. 
but uh, we also have people who have worked on different parts of the value chain. So let me start with Mr. Gilroy Tellis. Maybe he can introduce himself, the company, how he's reinventing the wheel, and also how the shortest or the, the nearest innovation is in uh, local, regional uh, travel and transport. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the, so, so I'll just give you a brief introduction of myself. Uh, I've panned a journey of a quarter of a century. I don't know if I look that old, but, but let me start with that. And uh, have worked across industries and categories, uh, typically in the having a province in sales and marketing. Uh, worked with companies, product companies like Xerox, uh, spanned across uh, the media space by being one of the initial members of launching a very famous private FM channel called Radio Mirchi. Uh, and then came this particular consulting stint that ran for about 10 years. And that's typically where it got me interested in product development because as Kotler always put it, you know, there's a first P of marketing which is primarily the most important P, uh, which is product. And if you have a great product, uh, as they say product is king, if you have a great product, it has to meet the expectation of the customer. Uh, if it meets the expectation of the customer, there is a reason why you would be successful. And that is the underlying reason of success. Uh, and during this journey, I think what came across is that I understood the value of redesigning customer value. And I believe that in the journey that we take to, towards sustainability, I think redesigning customer value would become a very important part. Uh, of this entire ecosystem. Uh, coming to the mobility space, typically that's the topic that we are talking about. In the mobility space today, which the segment that we are talking which is in the short term, uh, in-city transport, last mile, first mile connectivity, passenger commute, there has to be something different, right? We, we need to understand as to what exactly is it that we bring to the table. Uh, and is it something innovation, uh, innovative that uh, we could look at? And that's the journey that we undertook, and that's something that I want to be talking about. So when we looked at vehicles that are being produced in this country, the first question that came to our mind is that, how is it different in terms of technology where the world looks up to us and says, hey, you know what, this is different? And that is where redesigning customer value plays a very important role. So what do you do? You start innovating. You start looking at scientific ways of how to be different. And I think the core differentiation that comes to the table is what do you get as an outcome of what you develop? And that is a journey that we, we undertook. And today when I look at innovation, I believe somewhere down the line that uh, as a founder of an of a e-mobility startup, uh, which typically would be addressing last mile, first mile connectivity. What is missing today is innovation in the EV space. Now, when we talk sustainability, let me give you a term, uh, the thought of sustainability. When I, when I look deeper into sustainability, uh, there, it comes from a Latin word called sustain re. Okay? Uh, sustain re typically means uh, it's about maintaining, upholding, and supporting. And it's the ability for us to go forward uh, in a manner that you continue the journey. So in the, if we are looking at sustainable commute, the first question that we need to be asking ourselves is, what is the efficiency that we can bring to energy consumption? And I think that is a question, it's not about putting a battery. You know, when I look at m the mobility business today, I look back when I was a kid and given this particular toy, which was a battery-operated car, uh, which had a motor, which had, which had uh, a battery, and it had tires, and it ran. And that's typically what we do in the EV space. Now, how do we innovate and get things better and going better? And that's typically where technology plays an important role. Uh, so what we did is, we said, let's reinvent the wheel. Let's look at why do we have a round tire and not, uh, and question that. Let's look at why do we have a single motor and not a dual motor. Uh, we all know that EVs in this space typically are, they have their challenges. 
uh, can we empower them better? And the last important factor, if you're looking at it from a, uh, you know, and I don't want to go on because I have other panelists here, but a question that we asked ourselves is, kitna deti hai? When we buy a vehicle today in our, any car, the question that you ask yourself is, how much is the mileage that I get? The que underlying question is that nobody asks that, ki per kilowatt hour, ye kitna deti hai? And that's typically the answer that we were finding out. And it took us a journey of about four years to reach where we are today. And uh, we have answered and brought in higher efficiency on a powertrain of 36%. And when I say powertrain, it's not just the powertrain, but the holistic product. You know, it's not like you buy components put it together and say, hey, listen, I'm getting an effective EV on the road. No, the journey takes time. It takes investment of money, resource, intellect. And you put all of that together, and what do you get at the end of the day? You get something that delivers more. And that is through sustainability, my friends. And that's typically what we, we spoke about, and that's typically what we achieved. So getting a higher efficiency compared to the market on an Apple to Apple product, is that is the result of a sustainable effort that you put in, in product development. And my, I mean, I may be talking like an engineer, uh, but I really believe in the true spirit of engineering. Uh, and I believe that today when you do engineering, it's not about just engineering, it's not just about electromechanical, it's about how do you make products smart. And uh, that's the journey that we undertook and I was very happy to be part of this panel and uh, with very intelligent people around me. And I look forward to hearing more from everyone and if there's any questions coming, we'll be very able, happy to answer going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think the, the crux of redesigning, redesigning for a new purpose is driving a lot of entrepreneurs. On that topic, let me move to uh, Rohit, who is an engineer in an in a company incubated at IIT Madras, reimagining re trucking and reimagining yeah. trucking from ground to the earth. So yeah. take us through your journey. Yeah. Thanks a lot. First of all, I think I would like to thank the Thai uh, Delhi team for having me here on the panel. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a it's a very, it's been a very um, nuanced journey for us. I mean, so I graduated from IIT Madras in 2016. So my background is aerospace engineering. Now before even I went to IIT, my brother was saying, you know, why are you wasting your time? According to him, I was wasting time <laughs> to build some engine at home. But he said, go to IIT, you will get better labs. Well, luckily I heard him, <laughs> so I went there. Uh, so there I met a professor in aerospace department, and he was doing something really amazing in. Um, aviation engine technology. So I was like about to graduate and said, hey, uh, this technology is there, you know, maybe in four or five con countries and it's only in aviation and why is it not being used other, other places like trucks or power generation or, you know, in a more commonplace use. So we asked a very simple question that why is it so expensive to make that damn engine? I mean, can you not make it cheaper? I mean, if you can do that, you might end up you know, democratizing the technology. So that is what at Aerostrovilos we are doing. Uh, I know the word is, uh, the company's name is Mouthful, but I think I want you guys to hear it twice or, or read it twice or thrice so that you can remember it anyway. Um, so yeah, I think essentially what we are doing is we are making these aircraft engines, we are miniaturizing it down. And the reason we have picked up trucks, I'll tell you it's, it's very important. So if you look at, you know, uh, decarbonizing as a whole for mobility, I mean, well, not everybody, understands that space, okay, we being engineers, we understand, you know, the, the limitations of various technologies, but batteries is not going to just solve all our problems. I mean, like, we think that we can do that, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> you think you can drive, a, you know, a ship or an aircraft with just batteries, you'll be just taking away the batteries, not people, right? So, truck is where the problem becomes bigger, uh, or, or problem becomes challenging for batteries, and I think if you go beyond other heavy duty transportation ships, you know, that, that's where you'll, you'll really face the trouble. So I think we picked up trucking, uh, specifically we wanted to, uh, in some sense, you know, understand that if we can make it better. And then there were other players before us who have done the same thing, but obviously if you use the aircraft engine, you can't really meet the cost. And for an Indian market and similar markets, cost is the key thing, right? And uh, well, well, if we talk about now innovation in the you know, EV space, in trucks, there are only two companies in the uh, in India, right? And globally, there are maybe four or five. This is the most uh, least innovative space, I would say, and that that needs innovation so badly. 
I'll tell you why. So we are talking about $3 trillion economy or $5 trillion economy, right, in the country. And do you know about 15 to 20% of that is just logistics. And about 75, 80% of that logistics is trucks, right? So you're talking about almost like 500 billion, 600 billion, you know, just on trucks. And almost half of it is diesel. So now you imagine, can I make a dent over there which can be big enough, right? And if I can actually make this thing more sustainable, if I can come up with a better electric powertrain and a turbine. So by the way, this whole solution actually still works around an electric powertrain, which is a series hybrid. You have an electric motor driving. So rather than storing energy in the battery, I would say I'll just produce it on the go through these turbine. And our innovation is to use any fuel. You know, it can be diesel. It can be diesel. I'm not saying it has to be diesel. It can be diesel. Right now, that's the only infrastructure, right? It can be eventually like hydrogen or ammonia or any of these fuels. And that is the innovation that we brought in and say, hey, can we actually make this system so versatile that it starts today and gets us through the transition of going all the way to uh, decarbonizing and taking, taking us through the net zero. And I think you have to have a solution that is not infrastructure dependent to do that in the shortest way possible. Uh, because if you are getting into the infrastructure challenges, then you are going to have a chicken egg problem. Do I need to have enough uh, engines that can run on a particular fuel or do I have that fuel infrastructure, right? So I think this is the biggest uh, innovation and I think that we are, I would say we could call ourselves Teslas of the trucking world, but yeah, uh, I, I'll just leave it at there. May that, may that be true. Um, let no one tell you that something is rocket science and if it is rocket, if it is not, maybe we can make even trucking rocket science. Actually, gas turbine science is tougher than rocket science. Gas turbine runs for tens of thousands of hours, rockets only for two minutes. That is true. And actually, let's remember India has missiles. We have rocket, rockets. We don't have a turbine engine of our own. Yeah. One of those things, it's, it's a sign of a developed economy to have your own iOS and your rockets and, and your jet engine. We don't have either of them yet. But let me now come to uh, Ms. Sangeeta and talk about the longer term, both long in terms of duration and in terms of, uh, I mean, distance and time and, and how we can decarbonize long range transport. What is the the timeline that you're looking at it, and what are the pathways to get there? Thank you, Mudit. Um, I'm just going to take a step back and for everyone here to make you understand who are we and uh, how, are we, how are we responsible for sustainability and why are we here? So we are Lufthansa Group. We are one of the four, we are the fourth largest aviation uh, group in the, in the world. Uh, the fact that we transport 100 million passengers every year and 300,000 passengers actually transit through our hubs um, every day, it definitely makes us responsible and sustainability is in our DNA. We started this journey um, not now, much, much earlier. In 2011, uh, we already had the first trial with sustainable aviation fuel, which was uh, a scheduled flight, and it was successful. Um, so one is that, and then today we are at a stage where uh, we say that we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, and by 2030, we want to be at least 50% there. And how are we gonna do this? And there are, I'm not even gonna talk about, like we say, the circular economy about, you know, wastage, food wastage, e-trucks, and all of that. I think that's, that's the given. Uh, no plastic, I'm not even going to discuss that because that's expected and I think everybody in this room is also doing that. Um, how do we reach there? Fleet modernization. We are spending almost about 200, um, uh, 2.5 billion euros in uh, 200 aircraft that are going to come in the next few years and uh, cutting edge technology where each aircraft is going to reduce the carbon emission by 30%. Um, let me take one step back and say that the man-made carbon emission from the global aviation industry amounts to about 3%. While it is less than automobile, it is still our responsibility to contribute in whatever way we can, and we are doing our best to shape uh, sustainability for aviation um, as well. Um, we definitely were the first airline in 2011, and we are, uh, we've just recently, last year, invented something that we called um, shark fin technology. So there is this bionic film, adhesive, which goes on the aircraft. It starts from somewhere in the middle and goes on the fuselage and goes all the way out. What does it do? It actually uh, 
um, optimizes the airflow, reduces the drag, and it um, helps in reducing the carbon emission by almost 1.1%. And we have a triple Boeing 7 right now, which is operating with Lufthansa Cargo with this, with this film. Uh, long term, you said. Long term, one is this, uh, sustainable aviation fuel. What is sustainable aviation fuel? So it's an umbrella term that we actually use for all the aviation fuels that are not biofuels. Um, in 2022, when you say long term, in 2022, we had only about 240 uh, thousand tons of sustainable aviation fuel available for the entire global uh, aviation industry. What do we really need to be absolutely 100% carbon neutral? We need 254 million tons. There is a supply chain issue. And how is this going to happen? This is only going to happen when we have strong research partners. We will have um, our customers who are willing to pay a little higher because this, there is going to be a cost added to this. There is... Um, need for political and business will to be a part of this as well, scope 3 certification. Uh, in India, I have to say, while we're not really talking about it, um, there is no subsidy or tax um, reduction if a company is actually buying sustainable aviation fuel. So long term, definitely this, intermodality. Intermodality, you know, you, uh, Gilroy, you talked about um, in-city, last mile, first mile, um, so you'll be um, very interested to know that we have tied up um, with German Rail. We have between German Rail, we've recently tied up with uh, the rail system in Korea. So almost about 56 destinations, which you get into a hub, and from there you can take a train. There are a lot of corporates who are consciously actually taking trains. Um, I can very proudly say Bosch is one of them, even in India. They get into Frankfurt or Munich and then they train it on, uh, you know, on forward to Stuttgart. So there's a lot happening on that front as well. And um, eight destinations with, uh, with, with Korean, it's called Conrail, which, has, which we've just signed. So there's a lot happening on that front as well. And uh, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that's going to happen is that how are we going to produce more sustainable aviation fuel. So there is research going on in uh, liquid to fuel. There is research going on on sun to fuel, uh, which is going to be uh, thermal and hydrogen. And uh, I think we are very confident by then we, we should be able to reach that. Thank you. I think the kinds of effort that you mentioned show the commitment of the company, but also the challenge, the magnitude of the challenge that we are all facing. Karthik. We've heard of people who are doing in-city, intercity, intercontinental, all kinds of transport. But, and uh, Sangeeta, you also talked about the research side of things. So connecting the research and the startup world and how technologies are coming to, to the market. Share your experiences on what you're seeing and where do you see the most impact coming from in the startup ecosystem? I think <laughs> so. <laughs> the most impact comes from the entrepreneurs who are slugging it out, right? Uh, but uh, I think uh, there is, obviously we have gone through a few generations of clean tech innovations, maybe it's more the investor cycles, right? And, and uh, I think the most important part to remember for, uh, you know, independent of whether you're a sustainability entrepreneur or a clean tech entrepreneur, the first rule of entrepreneurship still applies, right? So you need a customer in front of you, and I think that evolution is coming, right? And that's going to be the most valuable. And that's where the, the entrepreneur becomes the connect. Like, Rohit is a great example where the entrepreneur becomes the connect between the invention innovation ecosystem, which is R&D, right? So we are, we, are, uh, we, can't disclose, right? like we are about to close an investment in Aristovillos, but, you know, Professor Satya worked on this for like five, seven years before it was kind of coming out of the uh, university ecosystem, right? And then you need the entrepreneur to then connect to the market. And, and the key there is to find pathways to scale, and that means finding a customer who can give you that feedback, right? And, and a lot of it can be corporates, right? But also people who are using uh, so, you know, it doesn't need to be the OEM, it could be like a Lufthansa, not Airbus, 
who kind of comes and says, hey, I want this bring it into your innovation ecosystem, right? So you need to kind of look at the layers of who wants it the most and find that to kind of build it, right? Uh, and I think the, the biggest issue and uh, what I think needs to evolve is uh, if you take climate, right? Cl and especially climate uh, venture investing, uh, it's, you know, it's an intersection of invention, innovation, it also, you know, I think there are a couple of mentions, it requires infrastructure, right? Something needs to, you know, there's a chicken and an egg where you need the charging ecosystem, you need EVs, you need, uh, you know, kind of fuel ecosystem, and then you can have, like, hydrogen trucks, right? Uh, so you have that, you know, chicken and egg problem around infrastructure that you need to build. Uh, and then the last piece is, as soon as everything looks amazing and you have the customer and the value proposition, you're basically kind of driving this into a commodity, right? There is, you know, at the end of the day, you can have layers of, you know, first class, business class, or using <laughs> some analogs, but, uh, and you can have layers of pricing, but at the end of the day, the base of, like, you know, somebody wanting to go from A to B has a price that's global. Right? And people want to get to that, right? Like they want to get to that Kitna Deti kind of conversation. So independent of if you have the you know most unique battery technology or engine technology, you're getting to basically commodity numbers that you want to meet for like utility scale solutions, right? And so investors need to get comfortable with that trajectory of building innovation businesses that cater to the masses. And I think that is coming, but it's not that yet, right? So it's it's inevitable is when investors start investing. We need to make it inevitable as investors and entrepreneurs. No, I absolutely agree with that. And in my own role, I see that transition happening a lot, where increasingly investors are more interested in deep tech, in actually atoms more than bits and bytes. So to, to, to me, that's a, that's a lived reality. But you had a very interesting point on the motivation of the entrepreneurs and the infra for innovation. Let me go back to both Gilroy and Rohit on that. Um, what was the motivation? Was it the, the seemingly uh, large demand for sustainability that drove the decisions to get into the space? Was it your own competence or your background? So if you can take us through how you decided to start off in this sector and, and, and try and innovate in this sector. Well, uh, mine is, I would say, is not the best example, but maybe it's the best example for a deep tech entrepreneur. I'll tell you why. So as I, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, rejogged my memory of why I went to IIT, it was <laughs> maybe to make a better engine. And then I realized what kind of engine it has to be. But I think slowly and steadily I, get, I got there and then I realized, okay, I mean, uh, there has to be a problem that we have to solve, right? Okay, it was a more of a engineering and a passion-oriented uh, de uh, decision that was driven. I'm like, okay, I, I just jumped into the pond and started swimming, right? Uh, but uh, I, I guess maybe that's how all deep tech, <laughs> you know, startups start. Um, so that was how my journey started. But I realized that there's a problem that we want to wanted to solve, and if we're not uh, putting ourselves, giving ourselves enough, uh, you know, chances of succeeding, and that means like we have to f we have to follow the trend in a sense that okay, maybe we have to catch a trend, or maybe maybe we were visionary uh, seven years back when we started, six years back when we started the company. But I think the vision kept on coming back to the clean tech and the mobility side, uh, primarily because we felt that, okay, that's a very big problem and that actually needs a solution. I mean, I, I keep coming back to the trucking, right? So uh, e even globally, we, we just talk about, you know, we are just becoming clean, we're talking on clean mobility, but nobody really gives a damn about trucks. You know, like trucks form only 4 to 5% of our road traffic, but actually makes 40 to 50% of our, uh, uh, you know, carbon traffic, right? So I think that's that. That is the, maybe we started with some other, you know, goal, but I think that is the reason why we are still driving that, hey, this problem needs to be solved, and I think we are giving ourselves the best chance if we actually solve this pro uh, you know, problem in a more versatile manner where we can, uh, so I think it's a good thing that we have seen the evolution of EVs and we have understood that there were problems of them to scale up, right? And we have seen the evolution of how the CNG vehicles came and they've, they've not really picked up. And we said, okay, can we actually make this thing a better off, right? And that is what, you know, keeps me awake in the night. So I'd just like to say a couple of uh, things. Um, 
One, uh, one in reference to what you said, uh, Karthik, and one in reference to what Rohit said. Um, uh, maybe because Rohit, you were talking. Um, there is something that we call the Innovation Hub at uh, Lufthansa, where we are constantly, and it's been in place for the last at least uh, over 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have the, the first one was in Berlin, and the other one is now also in APAC. We have uh, someone sitting in Singapore as well, a whole team that's actually looking at innovations, and we are working with startups. So we'd, we really encourage startups. We are looking at digital innovations because that's also, um, in a certain sense, energy saving. And uh, we are very happy to talk to startups who think they can help us in, in, this, in this area. Aeroshark was a, was a phenomenon that came from there. And there are many others in the last 10 years that we did come up with. Um, Karthik, um, you were talking about the final commodity out there. So, there also has to be a willingness from the customer to pay the price, not just from the investor, um, to be conscious about the fact that we need to be sustainable, that we need to be green. And uh, we've launched something that's called Green Fairs, uh, which obviously has a little markup where 20% of that goes to sustainable aviation fuel and the remaining 80% actually goes to all the other climate protection programs. And we launched this only on the continental routes within Europe. And this was only four months ago. And we were not really sure what the success is going to be. Uh, and I'm telling you this because, and I'm talking about this because I think the customer mindset is also changing. In four months, we've had 450,000 customers who actually went on Lufthansa.com and bought those green fares. So there is this willingness, and we are very encouraged very soon. We're going to start putting these on the inter intercontinental routes as well. So short term, you know, these are the kind of innovations that we're also doing. Thank you. And that goes back to the point of infra for innovation, which Karthik was referring to. But if I can come back to Gilroy, sure, on, the, on the journey of also identifying this space to innovate in, you mentioned you were a consultant earlier. Right. So how did you identify this space as your calling? Yeah, so in fact, uh, it comes from, you know, there are two ways uh, or two, two routes that, uh, that, that trigger you. One is the way that you are as a founder, or as a person, and the other is basically driven by, by need. Uh, overall, as a, so, so my way of looking at, uh, at life, uh, maybe because of the evolution of age that has happened over a period of time, uh, has driven me more towards living a very, a minimalistic lifestyle. And um, even when I used to go to work, I used to use a metro. I preferred keeping the car aside and taking the metro. Uh, and in that duration, during those 2015, 16, 17, when I got this consciousness, I used to use a lot of auto rickshaws. And, uh, and every time I sat in an auto, it was a CNG auto. Uh, so I thought that I'm, I'm in a better fuel efficient or sustainable fuel uh, kind of a commute. But when I dug deeper, I realized that for every, every kg of auto, of, of C CNG being used, there are 600 grams of carbon being emitted. And that's typically the trigger of this idea. And this happened in 2018, uh, in the beginning of it. And uh, that's when I started talking to people who are learned people around me, who was part of my circle, <laughs> typically guys from, from engineering backgrounds, and I had this thought that can we bring an electric vehicle uh, which is different? You know, the word, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, my fundamental of life has always been redesign customer value. And if you're able to do that, I said, you were able to bring in a more efficient product onto the roads. And that's typically the agenda and the mission that I set in front of me. I knew it was going to be difficult. The journey was never going to be easy. Uh, and every time I went on to the a pinnacle of attaining a result, I seen a pitfall. I have a colleague of mine here with me called Shelley, who knows the kind of heart pains and troubles and, uh, and, and acid attacks that we got around the way, acidity attacks that we got around the way. Uh, but the journey has been fruitful because every time you look at driving a result uh, towards being a sustainable entity, then every single action of yours is driven around that core agenda. And if the agenda is not just materialistic or not just recognition-based uh, and more driven to a cause, uh, the result is always going to be very, very fruitful. 
So the option in front of us was there's this low hanging fruit, very easy to design. I mean, if somebody tells me to manufacture an electric bus today, I can do it within six months uh, and with a differentiation. Uh, if if I, we get on a project to, to manufacture a train, we know that we'll be able to do it uh, because we have done this in the past in my consulting stints. But when it came to designing a product that actually needed to be more efficient, as Rohit rightly pointed out, that you know it's not about just the battery because you just don't have a battery and don't get interdependent on a particular fuel type. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about bringing efficiency of what we have today. Because we do know that battery as a technology is going to be utilized for at least the period of the next three years till we don't get evolved into the hydrogen aspect of things, right? Or don't come up with another more efficient fuel type that could be the future. And we are working on that also. I always believe that you always need to be proactive in whatever we do. So the journey has been, to answer your question, uh, the so Modit, the, the journey was evolved through a cause. And uh, we said that, and we challenged the entire uh, aspect of as a state. So when you challenge the as a state, what really happens is that you get a better result. Because you know that you cannot be comfortable with this as a state. It's better to get out of the comfort zone, do something different, feel good about it, and then commoditize it. And when we go to this market today, we know, we are very confident that uh, when we do a competitive, a competitive testing, and you get your competitor saying that, why didn't you launch earlier? Uh, why is that your product was not on the road yet? Why is it not on the road yet? Why is that, uh, how is that you're not so smooth? I think that's the best validation you can get. Absolutely, and, and that's typically with, which, which makes us really believe that we have done something right. So as I said earlier, that you know, though it is deep tech oriented, uh, so when I look at the investor fraternity, I'm, I'm too new in that space. Haven't really gone all out to investors yet. Uh, but when we, when we started trying to feel waters, uh, talking to investors, we found that there are multiple categories that come across us. You have impact, you have clean tech, you have deep tech, and then you have a lot of other things, which is uh, asset light, SaaS, you know, you name it and we have heard it. In that process, what I realized is that every investor looks at what value are you bringing to the table. Can your product sell? Will your product be bought? There are two ways, right? One is can you sell and can your product be bought? As a marketer, my thought would also be that can I not sell and can I be bought? And why should I be bought? And if you're able to answer all those questions, I think we are on the right journey. And since we are sitting with a panel of, of founders over here, typically who are driving their own enterprises, uh, I think the better thing for us to do is take the far-fetched apple. Journey would be longer, but the result will be sweeter. Yeah. That's typically my thought process in this. Thank you. Thank I think you. in the interest of giving the audience and the investors in the audience a voice, I think we have time for just one question. Um, and just a question, not a speech. So, to anybody in the panel, I have one hand up very quickly. Can we get a mic? Uh, Please introduce yourself, your affiliation, and then. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I think the question was um, uh, from Kirti, right? Kirti from Cisco for startups. What is the play of network and security within the mobility ecosystem? Right? I think it's <laughs> it's pretty significant. I think uh, you know, just like sustainability, maybe security will be an afterthought, though it should not be. Right? So once you get into things that become critical infrastructure, utility, you're basically looking at the same kind of security requirements with your vehicles. We're talking about vehicles 
batteries that can be charging the grid and all kinds of other things, right? And then somebody taking away vehicle safety, all of that, autonomous vehicles, all of that coming in. I think security is going to be a critical component of it. But I think I want to go back to this idea around network where I think with EVs, uh, one of the biggest pieces is going to be about how we use them. And especially around the vehicle and the battery, there's quite a bit of information, data, that can help drive efficiency, right? So a lot of what's happening today on that shift to sustainability is around literally having a digital twin of what's happening in the physical universe in the digital universe, and then the digital universe creating the intelligence that can inform us to be smarter in the physical space, right? And I think there's quite a few startups uh, that are working in that space, and, and, and that's going to evolve, right? So it's going to mean different for an individual purchasing a scooter versus a fleet operator to a city which is managing uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, which includes buses, charging stations, and all kinds of other things, right? So I think, you know, all the way across uh, from, from the smallest of things to, uh, and a lot of it's going to be on the edge, uh, but then the more it's on the edge, network becomes pretty important. Thank you. If any other speakers want to add very quickly a few thoughts, and then we'll close after this. Uh, I mean, yeah. So I think the, the, the big thing about EV now is that, you know, it's at the end of the computers on the wheels. It used to be engines on the wheels, now it's going to be computers on the wheels. So I think the security and network is going to be a big thing in, you know, driving the innovation. I think just adding on to what Karthik is saying. I also have a perspective to add. I think it was a very interesting question, and it propelled uh, myself from going and trying and picking up the mic, and, and Karthik said, okay, let me go answer this one. Um, we, you know, when we look at a, a product today, as, as rightly pointed by Rohit, that it's computer on wheels, uh, data is going to play a very important role. Uh, and controlling data, analyzing data, and giving a product, predictability, is going to become a very important part of the future because everything today, when you look at mobility, the journey is that we have electromechanical today. Uh, the future is going to be autonomous. And in between, there's something called smart. The smart was the missing link. Today, what, what your question is actually driving is typically what we have done. Uh, when you look at Tesla, uh, and I would like that to give that example because when it comes to electric vehicles, there's no other benchmark but a Tesla, but nobody wants to compare ourselves to them because they have far evolved. You look at the data streams that Tesla gets in terms of intelligence via IoT every nanosecond. And every single component is, is controlled. Every single component is analyzed. Every single component data is available with them. Why couldn't we do something like that? And that is a question that we have or we had. Uh, when you look at electromechanical, the only challenge that it doesn't have is data coming to you on every single component. And if you're able to make every component intelligent, use deep tech to the highest level to give you predictability, uh, you're going to be changing the paradigm of the game. And, and that takes time to do. It doesn't happen within six months. Thanks. So to answer your question, uh, or to, to elaborate on what your thought was, Security is going to become a very important point, both in terms of control, vehicle control, uh, keeping in mind that European Union laws will be followed in India in terms of transport, uh, and the fundamental of being having an intelligent product to tell you that, hey, listen, something is going to be getting wrong with me. Take care of me. And that's typically, I think, the future. And I think you've just pinched or nudged the future. Thank you. I think we've had a wonderful conversation going everything from reinventing the wheel to bringing uh, aerospace engines to the ground and now how vehicles will go from being engines on wheels to computers on wheels and, and, and hence the security implications thereof. So let me just thank the panel for uh, what, what was very interesting to me for sure and I hope some of it was interesting to you as well. Thank you. Picture, picture one. Picture, 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 picture.
One picture, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mudit. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you, Karthik. Thank you, Gilroy. And thank you, Rohit. Uh, Mudit, we will uh, need you for a uh, couple more minutes. But just a picture first. Could you just Hi, everyone. That's wonderful. I think in the morning, Sudhakar, uh, Sudhakar uh, showed us a building in Pune, which is like a wonderful structure that's come up. Uh, I think uh, we now have a session that will go deep into the built environment and the built spaces.